Good morning, church. How's everybody? Yeah, look at that, man. You guys are getting better and better at this. Everybody's awake. Didn't we have a good service last Sunday? You know, if we continue to carry that on to this Sunday, how awesome it would be, right? Thanks, Bill and Monty. Appreciate that. Well, it's good to see you this morning. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, We just uh, are excited about what God has for us today. So go ahead and stand. We're going to get ready pretty quick this morning because we can do the announcements at the end. Let's come in and ready to worship. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, tell your neighbor it's good to see them. Tell, Tell them ones behind you. It's good to see them. Tell them you love them. If you feel comfortable, fist bump them. Or you can do a turkey. (laughs) <laughs> okay, that's funny. All right. Well, just uh, real quick, I do want to announce a reminder to those that are in leadership next Sunday at 6 o'clock. Anybody who works in leadership, that means if you volunteer teaching on Wednesdays, if you uh, help in the youth, if you're part of the worship team, anything like that, if you serve in any capacity in this church, next Sunday we're going to be having a meeting here at 6 o'clock, Okay. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and just uh, invite the Holy Spirit just to move today. Can you do that with me? So can we just lift our hands to heaven just as an act of surrender? Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, we just ask that you would move in this place. Lord, we invite you, Lord, to do the things that you do. And God, we just ask if there's anybody here today that needs a touch from you, that they would receive it, God. We know that you are a God that meets our needs. And God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
God's worthy of more than that this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, I just believe that right here in this place this morning, Lord, that uh, you are turning graves into gardens. Father, that there are places that people have even thought that uh, it was over for them, that, uh, God, they would never see victory, they would never see happiness, they would never see peace. But, Lord, I declare before this day is over, Father, that in that place this morning where the enemy has spoke death over them, Father, they're going to have a garden begin to flourish in the name of Jesus. Uh, and, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that in that garden there's going to be joy and there's there's going to be happiness and there's going to be peace and there's going to be an excitement. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that the very landscape, Father, of their life, God, the very outlook of their life is being changed this day in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you have ordained us to life and, Lord, that you promised us, Jesus, that you had came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. So, Father, I thank you for the overflow of life this morning. Come on, somebody praise God for that. Come on, the overflow of life this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I just believe in Jesus' name that there's a fountain of life on the inside of you if you're a child of God, and that fountain in Jesus' name is springing forth, and is that fountain is springing forth that everything that is there that is trying to clog that fountain every piece of dirt every piece of debris everything of trash everything that the thing is trying to do to stop the fountain that fountain is coming forth with such an enormous power that is going to wash away all of that in Jesus name I believe that I feel that this morning so if that's you why don't you praise God one more time this morning? Hallelujah! 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 And we call ourselves blessed as we continue to worship and bring our tithe and offerings to the Lord. Amen.
belong to Jesus? What's the old song? I'm glad he's mine and I'm his. Hallelujah. It makes me think of a, a hymn that I remember singing as a little boy. Somebody loves me, answers my prayer. Amen. I'm so glad that there's somebody named Jesus who loves me. And I'm his and he's mine. And I bless the Lord. We're so glad you're here this morning and we welcome you. We, we want to... Uh, um, pray in just a moment before we do there are a couple announcements i want to remind you of and i know paul's going to make some more at the end of service uh but i appreciate we had three guys this past thursday at 5 30 uh so uh, again that's that vain worldly announcement i made last that uh, we are uh, just a fellow a great time of fellowship uh, played nine holes of golf for, uh, thursday afternoon at 5 30 we'll be doing that again so if you'd like to fellowship with us we invite you uh, to come and uh, be with us and uh, again it was a great time of fellowship that's the main thing that is the main thing bill yeah no get up. I said many of you were probably involved in Promise Keepers many years ago, and you know how it was a tremendous move of God for men, and it's kind of went dormant for a number of years, and it's it's kind of kicking back off. And and uh, uh, there, I apologize for this, but there we are. No, it's going to be a bad statement. I don't apologize that we are a, a simulcast host, mm -hmm. but that I haven't or we haven't promoted it the way we should have. But it will be this weekend. Uh, put on so I can read. But uh, it'll be here at church. Uh, the actual event is in Arlington, uh, Texas. But we'll be here Friday night from 7:30 to 10:30. Saturday morning from 10 o'clock till 3:30. Uh, a lot of great speakers like there's always been, you know, Tony Evans, his son Jonathan Evans. If you know, uh, if you're a Cowboys fan, you know, Tony was a chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys for years. Now his son Jonathan is. But uh, Samuel Rodriguez, Lieutenant uh, mm. General uh, Jerry Boykins. But uh, just a great time. We, I know it's going to be, and it's for old, not just us old men, but young men too. It would be great to see a lot of young men here. But we'll be here in the sanctuary, and I uh, just hope you'll come out and join us. So it starts Friday night? At 7.30 Friday 7 night. And what time Saturday morning? 10 o'clock. Okay. And there's no registration fee for this, right? So, yeah, if you go in person, you have to register. And the other thing I wanted to uh, say was uh, I've had several the last few weeks ask me about joining the church or others that have mentioned that they've talked to some. So we're going to plan a pastor's chat uh, sometime in the middle of August, and we'll give you more dates about that uh, exact time as we get it planned, but uh, somewhere around the middle of August. So if that's something you're praying about, consider, and we'd love to have you uh, to be a part of that. Amen. We want to pray. Has Rhonda got back yet, uh, Jack, or is she coming back? Where's Jackson? Jack, 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 Jack. Jack has left the house. Uh, well, you would know that Sister Kathy um, blacked out um, and uh, wrecked her car. Uh, she's in ICU at Rutherford, and they were waiting for a consult from the uh, cardiologist, and uh, they think that she may have to have a pacemaker put in. And uh, so they were kind of waiting on that. So, uh, uh, so we want to pray for Sister Kathy this morning. And uh, I've had several other prayer requests. A gentleman in in Asheville that had open heart surgery that uh, uh, he's probably on life support at the, this moment. Uh, they were amazed they even came through the surgery. And I want to pray for them. Those that have had surgery in the church over the last uh, couple of months that that are still uh, recovering. And I know there's others. There's others I had on my mind this morning, and somehow I can't uh, recall them back this morning. 
but the Lord knows uh, every one of them, and the Lord cares about every one of them. You may have saw my mom had to leave. She's, uh, was having, she has back pain every day, but it was a little worse today, so that's the reason Cheryl had to take her home. So I appreciate your prayers for them also. Would you just raise your hand before the Lord, and let's believe God. And, and the names that I'm forgetting, I'm believing the, that the Holy Spirit would cause them to come to your mind. If there's people in your heart this morning that you know need to be prayed for, would you just call their name before God? Lord, I'm so glad that we're a corporate body. And we're not just one individual, but God, we make up the church. This part of your church and God, so together, Lord, we can bring our brothers and sisters and the other needs before the Lord. I pray for them this morning. I speak your name over Sister Kathy. Lord, you see exactly what is going on with her today. And Lord, I just believe, God, that you're going to bring healing. You're going to bring all that is needed. And she's going to come through this with strength and grace. And I bless you that you're our healer. I, I, Rebecca, that uh, Becky uh, Myers that will be going through the, the, the heart procedure this week, I pray for Sister Becky, Lord, that you would be with her, your hand would be upon her. I pray this morning for those that are still there in southern Florida, uh, Lord, and all that is going on there, all the recovery efforts, Lord, I pray for them in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would be with them and be with those families, Lord, that have lost loved ones, and I thank you and I praise you for that. And, uh, Lord, again, for the nation of Haiti, God, I if I followed that this week, Lord, that was my first missions trip, and I have a special place in my heart there, and I know we've got a lot of four square brothers and sisters there in Haiti. And Lord, I lift them before you, and God, just believe that you, God, would cause revival to break forth in the midst of chaos, Lord, not only there, but in our nation, God. We ask for that, God, and for every name, again, that's not been spoken forth, God, we just collectively bring those needs to you until he that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think unto him be the glory in the church in Jesus name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, open your Bibles with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 12. I'm really not going to preach on this uh, scripture. I want to use it as somewhat a springboard into where we'll be at least the next couple weeks um, uh, here in Ezekiel chapter 12. And we'll start reading with verse 1. So, you know, your Bibles, your iPads, your phones, or whatever. I just encourage you that if you're not reading your Bible on your phone, or if you're not taking notes on your phone, that your phone goes in your pocket. Can I get an amen to that? This is not the time to check Facebook. This is not the time to catch up on your emails. This is the time to hear the word of the Lord. Now, we all like sometimes the services where, you know, like even like last week where the old joke was the preacher don't even get to preach. But I want to tell you something. There is a need for the word of the Lord. Can I hear an amen to that? There is a need for the word of the Lord. The time that they're preaching of the word of the Lord, we're hearing God's word this morning. So would you give him that respect? Ezekiel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, Son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity. The real statement, that's the statement I want to pull from this morning, but the way the King James reads that, which really gives me my springboard into thought, told Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, this is the king, James says, prepare your stuff for removing, or either prepare your stuff for leaving. For the Bible says, you can go into captivity by day in their sight. You should go from them, from your place in the captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider, now hear this, hear this. It may be that they will consider Though they are a rebellious house, by day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight as though going into captivity, and at evening you should go out, go in their sight like those who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight 
and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight. You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground, for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel." Literally, the background of the scripture here, this is the finality of, if you will, the nation of Israel, the biblical nation of Israel as we would know that they had been. And uh, they were getting ready to go into Babylonian captivity. The king Zedekiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar had already set up as king of Israel, or Judah, uh, had already set up as king of Judah, was there. And uh, he was the last king of the line of all the kings of Judah that had had kings such as King David and King Solomon and uh, Jehoshaphat and other great uh, kings of Israel. Je Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. And as you get to this place, the prophet Ezekiel, we know that the land was getting ready to go into captivity. It was over. They had sinned against God. They had rebelled against God. They had walked not in the ways of God. So God says, Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. They're getting ready to go into captivity, but I want you to prepare your stuff for leaving. I want you to prepare your stuff for removing. I want you to dig a hole in the wall. I want you to go out through the wall. I want you to do it in the morning. I want you to do it at night. I want you to cover your face so that they may see and that they may understand and there may be something in them that they'll consider and they'll know that this is something that is a serious moment. It's a serious hour and they need to take heed to. Well, there's another king in the Bible that also is found in the book of uh, Isaiah, chapter 38. This was King Hezekiah. And the Bible says in those days, in verse 1, And those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to God and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, and surely I will add to your days fifteen years." I will deliver you in the city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city. And this is a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz. Or in other words, your, your, your life. Ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. So two things I want us to consider. First of all, that I believe we're living in the days of the coming of the Lord Jesus. I believe when you look at the world, you look at prophecy, you look at the way the world is lining up, you look at the alignment of nations, you look at the alignment of finances, you look at all the things that the Bible would even talk about how that this seven-year tribulation period is going to have to be in the days of the kingdom of Antichrist, of how things are lining up. So we know that if you are reading your Bible at all, that if you have any sense of prophecy, that we without a doubt are in the last days. Now where in those last days, I, I don't have a thing saying he's coming tomorrow, he's coming next week. But I firmly believe that we're living in the last days. I believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus is imminent. I believe soon and very soon we're going to see the king. So I believe the Lord is saying to the church a couple of things in, in, in face of that. The first thing I believe he's saying is he said to Ezekiel, it's time that you prepare your stuff for leaving. It's time that you understand that we're not going to live here forever that we're leaving here and it's going to be soon and it's going to be very soon. 
and they need to do this in the face of people. So all the people will begin to get their house in order, just like as he said to Hezekiah, that you need to set your house in order. You need to make things right. I believe there's been days that as the church we've, uh, and even as individuals, we've walked through things and God has spoke to us about things and we've rebelled against those things. We've not did them. We've pushed them on the back burners. We've swept them under the rugs. We, we just hope that they'll take care of themselves. I mean, it's people that God's called us to forgive. It's things that God has called us to do. It's people that God has called us to witness to. On and on that list could go but because of that we've not set our house in order because we've just pushed these things aside but I believe the Lord is saying in, in the face of the coming of the Lord Jesus that it's time that we begin to live like a people that we believe that Jesus is coming soon and coming very very soon and the second thing is that we as a people are setting our house in order now you may ask the question why is that important well, this is why I believe it's important. And this is where I want to go for the next couple of weeks. Because as Christians, somehow, we have the idea. And again, we sing the songs, which is all in well. And we shout the shout. And we talk the talk. And we, we have this idea that when the rapture takes place, or either we go through the grave, that that's it. Nothing else is done. We're safe home. It's good. Everything uh, is all right. But we forget that, yes, if we go in the rapture, or our heart is right with God, that when we go uh, through the grave, that yes, heaven will be our eternal home if we know Jesus Christ at that moment. But someone said it like this, that what I want to talk about is not so much as to where you're going to spend eternity, as to how you're going to spend eternity. Now you say, well, I'm just going to heaven. Well, understand this with me. Most Christians were not living like Jesus is coming soon. We're not living like that we're, we're soon going to see the king. And we're not living as a people that are going to give an account to God. Understand this with me. There are two judgments that are spoken of in the Bible. More judgments, but two major judgments. The one judgment we find at the end of the Revelation, which is the great white throne judgment, which is a judgment you don't want to stand at. Because that's a judgment there'll be no believers at. That's a judgment there'll be no saved people at. There'll be a, that's a judgment there'll be no escape from. Because the Bible says that that judgment, that even death and hell will be there. All that uh, have done those things and they will be judged. But then we hear the words, bind them hand and foot and cast them into a lake of fire. And so that is a judgment you don't want to be at, the judgment of the eternally lost people separated from God for eternity, for even as bad as hell itself is, that hell will be cast into a lake of fire. But there is a judgment. It's the amazing thing is that at both judgments, you'll be judged for your works. At both judgments... You'll be judged for your works. You say, well, Pastor, I, didn't, I thought we preach your grace and we preach here that salvation is by grace through faith and it's not through works. You're absolutely right. Well, remember, I told you as a Christian, I'm not talking about where you spend eternity. I'm talking about how you'll spend eternity. And I will tell you as Christians, although we don't live it this way, that we will stand before the Lord Jesus himself and we will give an account of the works we have done in this body. Do you believe that? I mean, most Christians don't live that way. We, we, we don't live like that. We, we don't take that into consideration. You've heard me say one of the things I try to live for in, in my life or a, uh, it's a value or just something I try to keep before me and Hey, am I perfect in it? Absolutely not. Do I fail at it? Yes, I do. 
But I try to remember that everything that I do is a command performance before the king. Every word that I say, every worship that I offer, every way I treat my wife, every way I treat my children, every way I treat you, how I treat my finances, how I do everything in life, everything is a command performance before the king. Because when I stand before the king that day, I will give an account of every bit of that. I will give an account of every bit of that. Why is that? Because the Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Now hear that statement. You are not your own. Let me say that again. You are not your own. What does literally that mean? Yeah, I'll tell you what it means to me. That means that I don't have right to make the decision outside of the will of God. I don't have the right to make decisions outside the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I don't have the opportunity or the, uh, the, the, the right, if you will, to make decisions where I don't take God and His Word into account. Because I am not my own. If I were my own, I'd be headed toward eternal hell. If I were my own, I'd be standing at the great white throne judgment. But when I became a Christian, I received eternal life, but I gave my life to Him. And when I gave my life to him and he washed me in his blood and he birthed me into his family, now the Bible says I am not my own. Why? Because we are bought with a price and therefore glorify God. Listen to this. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So everything about my life is supposed to glorify God. Every action that I do, every word that I say, everything about me is to do one thing, and it's to glorify the Lord Jesus, whether that's through you, through my family, through strangers we meet, through every word that I say and how I say it and what attitude I say them with, Every bit of that, because everything I do is to glorify the Lord Jesus. So here are these scriptures. The first one is Paul writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9 says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Say that with me. To be what? well-pleasing to him. Who is the him? It's the Lord Jesus, right? That, that is the him, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all, say all. all. Do you know you're an all? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether according to what he has done. Again, I told you, you'd be judged by your works, whether it be good or bad. Paul also wrote to the Romans about it in Romans chapter 14. And he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. That's basically saying, I don't have the right to stand in judgment of anybody that God has received as a child of God. They belong to God. They do not belong to me. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it's a, yeah, Don't shout me down this morning. I know this isn't word that makes us want to cut flips. But listen, these are words that will, uh, listen, if we'll give heed to these words, it will change how we live eternity. And if I live this life 
for a hundred years, which is very unusual for anyone to live a hundred years, that is but a small, if it's even a small fraction of the scope of eternity. So would it not be better to live this life in a way that I'm preparing as to how I'll live eternity? Because eternity is eternity. So then God asks the question, so who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And then he said, For to this sin Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand. Again, there's a word, all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we quote this next verse is to uh, against devils, against sickness, against disease, against battles of life. But in the scope of this scripture, the way God wrote the scripture, the Bible says here that, listen, at this, every one of us shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in his brother's way. So again, when you hear the scripture that we don't stand in judgment, why? Because I'm going to be judged. Right? We're all going to give an account of God. There are things, listen, if the word of God is black and white about it, there is, there, there's no question. But there may be other things that the word of God may not be black and white about. And we stand in judgment because we have this relationship and we see things this way. And God, listen, God says, child of God, your main concern is that you shouldn't be judging one another. But you should realize you're going to be judged. And in that face, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this morning, whether or not I'm willing with my life, with my words, with my action, with my love, whatever else it may be at this moment, I'm willing to do it. There will be a day at that day I will confess that Jesus is Lord. But now here are the last scripture in these, this section. And this is where the Apostle Paul, again to the Corinthian church, makes it more real to the church. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 39, Brethren, I cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as the babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you're still carnal. In other words, you're living according to the flesh. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Mere men belong to themselves. We are not mere men because we're sons and daughters of God, and we belong to God. That was a parenthesis. If you're looking for that life statement, it wasn't there. For when one says, I am a Paul, another says, I am a Paulus, or you're not carnal. Who then is Paul? Who is a Paulus? 
but ministers to whom you believe this of the Lord gave to each one. I planted, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor is he who waters, but God gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For you are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, this is how we live life. This, this is our works. If anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones. But then he gives three other things, wood, hay, and straw. What, what can happen to wood, hay, and straw? It can be burned up. And each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And fire shall test each one's works of what sort it is. And hear this, child of God. This is talking to us. This is how we're going to spend eternity. If anyone's work which he builds on it endures, he shall receive a reward. I don't know about you. But I want some rewards when I get to heaven. I'll give this scripture to you later, but let me go ahead and tell you now. I don't work for my salvation, but God told me I do need to work for the treasure I'm sending on ahead. Is that not the word of the Lord, Bible readers? Again, my salvation is, I'm never taught to work for my salvation because it can never be good enough. If I am taught to live life in such a way that I'm working, that I'm laying up treasures in heaven, that we're moths and thieves and are not corrupted and they don't break through and steal. But hear this, if any man's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Now this is a strange statement to most children of God. Because again, we think we're just, we're floating through this thing. We're going right into the presence of God. And immediately we're going to be cutting flips and praising God and shouting and giving glory to God. No, before you ever get a chance to do that. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ. And there we're going to see everything that we've lived our life for. Everything I did as a child of God, either God will say, well done, good and faithful servant, or I'll see everything I've done in life burned up and fade away. And it'll be as if I never did one thing for the kingdom of God. Now that may not trouble you, but that troubles me. It troubles me in the fact that one day I'll look into the eyes of the very one who died for me. Not a message about him, not or a picture on the wall or reading about him in the Bible, but I will stand before him. John the Revelator saw him, and John the Revelator saw him as eyes with fire. Can you imagine when those eyes of fire begin to penetrate through every one of your works? That's the reason you've heard me say before, I've saw people in church that sometimes worked harder or as hard as anybody else where they grumbled the whole time they were doing it. When they stand before God on that day, it'll be as if they never did it. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, God's told us these things. We've been pre-warned. And so there is something about thinking about how I'm living life, how I'm 
doing this thing. That's the reason when I used to pray, God, make me a good preacher. God, make me a good daddy. God, make me a good husband. God told me. He said, before I can ever make you any of those things, I've got to make you a good man. Because it's out of the nature of who you are and out of that relationship with God that permeates throughout everything else in your life. And then again, he reminds us, do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You know, as I was growing up and preaching, all I ever heard that verse was for people preach against smoking. Uh, that, that, that's the key verse. Well, they preach against smoking, that, that's a key verse. But it had nothing to do, what well, could have to do with smoking, but it has to do with so much more than just smoking. It has to do with how I'm living this life. Do we not understand that as a Christian man, that even my grandson, my daughter, my wife, I'll stand before God for how much of God I let flow through my life to them or how much of the flesh I let flow through my life to them. So there is a judgment seat. There is a time ahead. Again, it will not determine your eternity because it says here, it goes on to say, they will be saved, but yet... So is by fire. But it will determine how you spend eternity to the be. When I think of that, it brings Paul's other writing to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 11, when he says here that if I would judge myself, I would not be judged. I looked at those words, and there's, you know, in our English language, we think that both of those words are one and the same. The word, if I would judge myself, I would not be judged, so that it's the same. But it has, it's not even close to being the same. Paul is saying basically that if I will look at my life, I will distinguish my life, I will examine my life, I will determine about my life, if I rightly divide my life, then I won't be judged. And that second word, judge, there is a legal term. The first one isn't. The first one is a choice. The second one is a legal term. And it means if I live life making the choice that I'm going to look at my life and determine how I'm going to spend eternity, then I won't face the legality of my work so I'll be under the blood. And I'll be able to hear before him that day again saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So if I look at my life, now hear this. Do you think as a Christian there exists the ability to be ashamed when we stand before Jesus? Boy, I tell you, if this doesn't kind of shake you a little bit, then I wonder how passionate your relationship with him is. For as the Bible says here in 1 John 2, 28, And now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. New American Standard Version says it like this. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. But yet, again, the whole church, nothing wrong with it. We sing the songs about the coming of the Lord. We talk about the coming of the Lord. We say, I wish Jesus would come, but we're not living our lives like that. But I wonder how many of us on that day when he comes will be ashamed when we stand before him. Dear God, let, let it shake my life. Let it shape, not only shake, but let it shape my life. When I realize I don't, can you imagine? 
I, I don't know if I can even imagine. Every time I think about it, it just somehow my feeble mind cannot even relate to it. That when I look in the eyes of the one that came and took my sin, because without that, care what the world says, what media says, there are no other ways to God but through the cross of Calvary. And the very one that when there was no other way, he came and died for me. He took my sin. He paid the penalty for sin. And he took all of my shame. And, and he gave me my righteousness. You see, I also believe this, that when I see him, I'll be able to think with every bit of my mental understanding that I'm not able to think with now. And when I have full understanding of what that one that's sitting there on that throne did to give me eternal life, and I look how foolish I lived that life. Again, I'm 64 years old. You know that. Started in ministry when I was just 17, early 18 years old. And I look back on those years and I think, God, how many of those years will burn away? How many of those years will just burn away? God, how much have I did in life that I really did for your glory? I didn't do it through selfishness. I didn't do it because I wanted to do it. I didn't do it because this is the way I thought it would be done. But, Lord, how much? And I think about that. And I think it's something that we all should think about. Because it's not just for preachers. It's for all of us. And I don't have time to go through all of these notes, but you'll get them if you're on the email. And I encourage you to, to look at them. But I want to go to another scripture. Yeah, we've got time this morning, and I want to break this scripture down with you. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 12. We'll start with verse 13. It'll be on the screen. Again, they'd been there, the Pharisees and all that Jesus had been doing, the same discourse he'd have, and, and all that they had thought their religious ways was right, and Jesus had to correct them. But in the midst of that, the Bible says in verse 13, then one from the crowd says, Teacher, tell me to divide, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus looked at him and said, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. covetousness. For hear this, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. The word covetousness there means numerically more. It means to, to lust for things that are beyond the things which I need. And I'm going to say something to some of you that's going to kind of, this may upset some of you, but I don't say this to upset you. I say this to make you think. And I want you also to know that I'm not against toys in life. I'm not against vacation homes, I'm not against uh, buying campers and boats and golf clubs or whatever it is you're able to buy. But I get real concerned when I see people that are faithful to God start buying more and more toys to enjoy this life with. You say, well, you don't want us to be blessed and don't want us to be happy. No, that's not it. But the fact is, I know you've just put another temptation in front of you to take you away from your dedication of your life to God. We came through, still coming through this pandemic, pandemic of COVID. 
a time when we quit having church because of it. And yeah, we did it to save physical lives, but I wonder how many spiritual lives it affected. Which is more important than the physical. I'm not saying the physical is not important. Please don't misunderstand me. But I've saw some, and again, I'm so glad we have the ability to go into homes. I'm glad we have the ability to go on the radio. I'm glad we have the ability to go on the internet. Thank God for that. But that was never meant to replace the church. And it was never meant to replace the dedication to the church. Weiss says it in the Weiss New Testament. It's Kenneth Weiss, not Mike Weiss. I'm kidding. Now a certain person in the crowd said to him, Teacher, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who can constitute me a judge or divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and be guarding yourself from every kind of greedy desire for more. Because not in the sphere of that which is in superabundance enjoyed by anyone is his life to be found from the source of his possessions. And again, I'd say to you, no matter how many toys you've got this morning, if the cross is not before your toy, you need to get rid of your toy. I say that in love. I don't say that in judgment. I don't say that in condemnation. I just say that as one that will give an account of how I tell you the truth. And if you can't put your toy that you bought underneath the cross and make sure that your life with God is where it ought to be, but when every weekend is consisted of where we're going this weekend, what we're going to enjoy, and never think about the church of Jesus Christ and our walk with God, because I will tell you this, and I still believe this, that going to church will not make you a Christian. But I will tell you, that I still believe that your relationship with God, if you're not faithful to the house of God, then there is something lacking in your relationship with God. If you can be faithful, I believe that. I've looked at some people and I've told them, I wouldn't want to win a million dollars. And I'm serious about that. I, I'm not joking when I've said that. Because I ask myself the question, If I had that, would I still be as faithful to God as I am today? I think there are a lot of things to consider that as Christians we don't consider. Because again, we live this life like, well, I've heard this statement, well, we only got one, absolutely. But your life does not consist in what you have in abundance Your life consists, you are not your own, I am not my own, I belong to Jesus. And how I live life down here when I stand before him will affect how I spend my eternity. And that's where we'll go next week. This week I want you to get in your mind the reality of the surety of the judgment seat of Christ. So the scripture goes on here and Jesus now gives them the story. It's a parable. You realize the reason he speaks in parables is because there's spiritual understanding. Jesus doesn't have to speak in parables to people who have a spiritual understanding. Because you can understand spirit language. You can understand spirit talk. You can understand deep calls unto deep. But he had to speak to them in parables because, again, I heard it said this simple. It's an earthly saying with a heavenly meaning. But he had to speak to them in parables so he could speak something they could relate to and could be implied a spiritual matter. So now he says this. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? 
So he said, I will, tell, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater. And there I will store all my crops, and I will store all my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat. Drink and be merry. Enjoy life. Amen. You're just going through it one time. Enjoy it. Spend it. Live it. Does God want you to be happy? Absolutely. Would God give you happiness that are beyond any scope of what you can imagine? Absolutely. But if the goal of my life is just to enjoy what I've got here, I'm just like this rich man. God said to him, fool. Fool. I didn't use that word. God used it. Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be for which you have provided? And then he asks the question or he makes a statement. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God? Can I ask you a question, how rich you are toward God this morning? I'm not asking you how much money you got or you know, how many toys you got. I'm just asking you how rich you are toward God. Because that's the thing that will stand in that day. You hear what Jesus said in Matthew 6, and then we'll go back to the Scripture. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. This is, this is what I told you a while ago. I had to give you this verse. It's Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Listen, he's not speaking to lost people. He's speaking to his people. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That tells me I need to be working to lay up treasures in heaven. Again, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this. For where your treasure is. My God, let us hear this this morning. For where my treasure is, there will my heart be also. If my treasure's in my job, if my treasure's in my bank account, if my treasure's in my toys, if my treasure's even in my family, it's in the wrong place. I want to be rich toward God. Because wherever my treasure is, there's where my heart is. And then he speaks again to the disciples going back to Luke 12. And therefore I say to you, do not worry about life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither storehouse, have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious about the rest? And then he gives us these great illustrations. Consider the lilies, how they grow there. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like to one of these. If God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink or have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. But this is where he says, But seek the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. So do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So this is what he tells them. Sell what you have and give alms. It's almost like the, the rich man that went away sorrowful because he wasn't willing to give away any of his treasure. Jesus tells them, in the midst of saying, don't worry about anything, then he says, sell what you got. Whoa, Lord. 
Sell what you got and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. (laughs) And treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For again the verse, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How much of life do we live thinking about how we're going to get ahead? What new toy we're going to buy? How much bigger bank account we can have? I saw Christians live life working to lay up money down here. Is it wrong to plan? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to have a savings account? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to plan ahead? Absolutely not. But when that becomes the driving force of your life and Jesus and your love for Him is not the driving force, then yes, it becomes a problem. And then the last section of this, verse 35, so let your waist be girded. And your lamp's burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are the servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself, have them sit down to eat, and will come and serve them. If he should come in the second watch or in the third watch and find this, so blessed are those servants. But know this. This is where we close this morning. But know this. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus said to know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and have not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore be you also ready, for the Son of Man come, is coming in an hour, which you do not expect. So I ask you are, you, are you really ready to meet the Master? Again, there's a song that one of the first songs I think I ever heard Crystal Watts sing was, Lord, I don't want to leave behind an unfinished task. Being 64, I don't know how many more years of active pastoring I've got. But one thing I do, and I've tried to make it a life goal for myself, I want to run across whatever that finish line is. I saw pastors get to the age that I am and they think, okay, I've did it, I've served it, I've, I've paid my time, I've did it. I can sit back and say, oh, everything's okay and just rest on the laurels of yesterday. But as long as I breathe and as long as I live, I'm sending something up. So as you think about your life, This morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, the greatest thing is the fact that you find Jesus as Lord of your life. Because if you don't know Jesus, just like there won't be any saved people at the great white throne, there won't be any lost people at the judgment seat of Christ. And you want to go to the judgment seat of Christ rather than the great white throne. And the only way to escape the great white throne judgment is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. And here this morning, you don't know Jesus. You've never made a commitment to Him. You need to do this this morning. But Christian, let me speak to you just a moment. And let me tell you that the way we're living, you know the reason the Holy Spirit is dealing with us? Do you know the reason the Holy Spirit is making you uncomfortable about some things? It's because He loves us. Because He wants us to get these things settled now and not have to wait till we get there and get them settled. I don't have the whole picture of how it affects eternity. I do believe, and I'll give it to you next week, some of the ways that God says eternity will be affected. I don't have that whole picture. I would be lying to stand here and tell you I did. But I know there is a reason that Jesus kept us telling us these things. 
And that's the reason that many of the parables that you read talk about stewardship. So my life is not my own. So how I live my life, I will answer to him. And I ask you this morning, when you look at your life, Angel, could you come on back around? If I look at my life, do I think now I'll be ashamed when I stand before him? Again, I don't pray and I don't read my Bible to to get more saved because the blood made me saved. But I'll answer for how I've spent time there. I'll answer again in my home, whether it was my way, I did things my way, I did what I want, when I want, how I wanted, but did I show the love of God to my, to my wife and to my family by living as a servant? See, a real godly person is a servant, because Jesus was a servant. So we're going to stand and we'll ask them to sing through a chorus verse or so. And again, if you don't know Jesus, these altars are open. But I just believe this. I don't believe the Holy Spirit would give me a message and Him not do His end. And His end is to bring it home to you and make it real to you. Some won't listen. I can do nothing about that. I pray for you, but I can't do anything about that. But those of you that are hearing God this morning, Christian, maybe there are things that God's already started speaking to you about, about your life, about your attitudes, about your love, about your passions. And you could go in and give them, put him under the blood this morning. And make a commitment to leave here and change the way you're living. And change your priorities this morning. Because the Bible does say to lay up treasures in heaven. Is that right? Not here, but in heaven. So would you be ashamed if Jesus came today? Are you ready? You're waiting. Know that soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Let's stand together. I know this is a sobering time. Anybody that's ever preached to ministers will tell you these are not the most favorite messages to preach. Because we all want to leave excited and hyped up and feeling good. But listen, there are times we need to be sober-minded. 
There are times we need to face truth. To get rid of all the anxieties of life and just calmly sit before God. And this is what I challenge you to do. Would you be brave enough to take your life and your toys before God? Would you be brave enough to take your life and your passions before God? Would you be brave enough to take your life and your dedications before God? And would you be brave enough to take your life and your family before God? Listen, guys, either now or that day, Bible clearly says I will suffer loss I don't want you to suffer loss I want you to have everything that God has prepared eternity for for you I want you to enjoy it all I don't want to see anyone suffer loss when they stand before Jesus. And that's not the loss of your eternal soul because Paul plainly says they shall be saved. But they will suffer loss. So Lord, I ask you, as we leave this house this morning, help us to be sober-minded before you. Help us to listen to the Holy Spirit. Help us to look at our lives Look at our passion, our loves, our just while we live life. And Lord, may we allow you to become the driving force of our life every day and live with the passion of that love. Let us have our first love again. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Paul. Amen. Just a few announcements before we leave today. Uh, first of all, remember the promise keepers that they talked about earlier. Uh, I would also encourage some of you young guys to get involved in that. Uh, we go on the men's retreat. We, we do the golfing stuff. And we always have a good time. It's not just for the old guys. Okay, so I need some young guys to come out. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all the old guys are shaking their head. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Donald is going to be doing a school supply fundraiser, so it would be awesome if we could help him out with that. Uh, in the back on the booth, there's a flyer there. Make sure you pick it up. Um, it's going to be uh, July the 4th at 6 o'clock, and it's just going to be uh, in honor of uh, Sydney, so we want to make sure and support that. And also, George, uh, are you still raising money yes. now? Okay. So uh, Ari's still trying to raise some money. I think it was $900, which is a cheap cost for a mission trip. I think we can, we can do that. So uh, if you want to help Ari, she's going to be going to Puerto Rico. She's actually serving in some of our sister churches now. Uh, so please make sure that you support that as well. And then also, uh, we're going to be having Chosen soon. Uh, before we know it, November will be here. We're already starting to plan for it. So... Uh, we want everybody to be involved in that as well. So we love you, church. We hope you have a great day. See you Wednesday at 6.30 and back again, what, Sunday at? 10.30. 10.30, okay. All right, you're dismissed.